is Steve Zeltzer with Workweek, and I'm with David. We've interviewed David before. He uh, is a activist. Uh, he uh, is a activist uh, organizer. He's president of the Vermont AFL-CIO, and he took some strong positions around the fight of the right wing in this country. His uh, federation, after a long discussion and debate, voted that there should be a general strike if there was an attempted coup or insurrection in Washington, D.C., and lo and behold, there was an insurrection and he was proved right. And despite that, the former president of the AFL-CIO, Richard Trumka, uh, did an investigation and threatened with putting the Vermont AFL-CIO uh, in trusteeship for illegally passing a resolution saying there should be a general strike against a coup in the United States. So I don't know what it takes to get a general strike in this country, but apparently uh, having a, a coup and insurrection is not one of those things. So anyway, thanks for joining us. Uh, on, on the show, um, David. Pleasure to be here, Steve, always. So David, first of all, we're coming up on Labor Day. We're also coming up in, a, in the collapse of the US supported government uh, military in Afghanistan. Um, the COVID uh, uh, epidemic is running rampant um, in particularly the South, but all over the country, it's not going away. We still don't have national health care. There are large numbers of workers who are still going bankrupt because they're being billed for their health costs. Um, labor is under attack, yet uh, workers are joining unions around the country because they see unions as the only vehicle uh, to defend themselves. So maybe you can talk about the aftermath of, of this investigation by uh, Richard Trumka, what happened, why he, you think he backed off uh, temporarily uh, from decertifying the Vermont AFL-CIO. Our experience over our uh, expressed uh, intent to defend democracy uh, was, uh, was trying at times. Uh, there was many folks around the country, uh, some very powerful, powerful people within the labor movement, who did not believe that what we were doing was the right thing. But we know that it was the right thing. If our democracy comes into crisis and uh, the very notions of um, of the constitution come into question through a neo-fascist right-wing attempt to seize power, then there's only one option for working people and that's to throw down their tools and walk off the job and take to the streets. This is what defense of democracy means. We were preparing to do just that. And again, we didn't just say that there should be a general strike. We were in discussions with um, city officials, city councilors in the city of Montpelier, uh, I'm sorry, in the city of Burlington, our largest city, uh, to coordinate such efforts. And through the Vermont Progressive Party, which is a Democratic Socialist Party here in the state that is the largest party in Burlington, with the most amount of seats on city council, we had allies ready to work with us. But the fight to defend democracy cannot end now that we've had a transition of power. Uh, to Joe Biden on January 20th. We see what's going on in the South. We see what's going on across the United States and in Texas just last week with the rolling back of uh, voting rights that's clearly targeting working class people, low income people, and the BIPOC communities, right? So we need to find a way nationally to push back against these uh, basic attacks. And we need to do more than that. We have to find ways to go on the offensive to try to build more democracy. Uh, more democracy in our workplaces, more democracy in our communities, more democracy at a state level and a federal level. Uh, the, uh, the Voting Rights Act that's being considered in Congress today is a start, but it's a very modest start. We must go much further. We have to explore ways that we can have a more participatory democracy and not to limit the notion of uh, majority control to privately voting in a ballot box. Here in Vermont, we have something called town meeting where on occasion, but at least once a year, the legislative branch of the local government is all the citizens together gathered in one place in a town hall where you could raise your hand and vote on the issues of your day and impacting your community. This is the kind of democracy we need to be building throughout the United States. And the issue of the rise of fascism, the fascists aren't going away. They are organized. And as you said, their right-wingers uh, want to disenfranchise Black brown people, Native American people from voting. Um, and the Congress, uh, even though it's controlled by the Democrats, is not uh, moving to eliminate the filibuster, 
which means that the PRO Act, all this legislation uh, with, uh, can be uh, basically uh, stopped unless there's a, 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 an end to the filibuster. How do you see that in relationship to labor's, the national AFL-CIO's plan to get any kind of reform through uh, legislation and emails and trying to lobby the Congress people? It seems that's their major <clears throat> organizing effort you know, mm -hmm. uh, around uh, yeah. changing the situation. Well, let me be clear. The Vermont AFL-CIO fully um, supports the PRO Act, fully supports the Voting Rights Act, fully supports the human infrastructure effort in the budget and the infrastructure bill. But we see those as very, very modest, small first steps in what we really need to see as a much larger, much far reaching Green New Deal, union led Green New Deal. But are you not surprised that things like the PRO Act haven't passed and the filibuster is still there? I mean, the Democratic Party has not been a, re a reliable uh, ally of labor since FDR and the Great Depression. That was quite a long time ago, uh, by my count. So if you think that us electing majority uh, of the Democratic Party into Congress and taking the White House is going to fundamentally change anything, uh, I would say you're insane. I mean, we did that under Obama. We've done that time and again, done that under Jimmy Carter. You know, the, we've done it over and over and over again. And yet our rights as working people seem to go backwards, not forwards. The Democratic Party is not a friend of organized labor as a party. There are individuals who are, but not as a party. And the national AFL-CIO would be wise to step away from the Democratic Party, take the tens of millions of dollars we fruitlessly sink into election, elections and put them into organizing. Put a staff of real organizers in every single state in the country to help our state uh, federations and our affiliates organize new workers and to earn, organize internally towards social and political uh, ends. This is what the national AFL-CIO needs to, to do. But I don't presently see signs uh, of that happening. This is why we need to change the culture from within of the AFL-CIO. Uh, federations like ours, uh, more uh, left-leaning or more radical locals or progressive locals around the country need to step up. They need to pressure their internationals. They need to pressure the national leadership, the AFL-CIO, to, to make these kind of changes and these strategic shifts uh, that have been demanded for by facts on the ground for decades and generations, but where uh, folks have not had the vision or the courage to take that leap. So that's what we need to do. And Liz Schuler, the newly uh, appointed head of the AFL, so there'll be an election next year, has said that uh, she's not going to make any major changes. And as you've said, that the AFL-CIO closed down their organizing department. They're leaving it up to internationals. And there are struggles in this country. There's uh, the minor strike in Alabama, which has been going on for over five months. There's the Nibis Nabisco workers strike, the bakery workers. But it seems like those strikes are not being taken up nationally by the labor movement, mobilizing all workers in this country to back these strikes. I mean, particularly the miners who've been out for such a long time. How do you see organizing a national campaign to back workers who are in struggle um, and how that can take place when it seems that's not the priority for the national AFL-CIO. Change that priority. So as long as the, um, the controls of the national organization are in hands of folks that are afraid to take such leaps, we're not gonna see the concerted efforts on a national scale to win and provide meaningful solidarity to folks like the miners down south. So we need to change that from within. We have an election next year uh, for the leadership of the National AFL-CIO. And I hope that uh, candidates uh, and a caucus emerges that uh, shares this progressive vision with the Vermont AFL-CIO and we would support them. And as far as uh, President Schuler is concerned, you know, she's been on the job for a couple of weeks now. Uh, we wanna see what she does. We wanna see if she changes her orientation or the orientation of the labor movement. We would encourage her and stand by her if she did. Uh, but if she does not, then, then we're going to have to seek change at our upcoming convention next year. But you mentioned, Steve, the rise of fascism in this country. So even while we struggle for, um, for our, our rights on the shop floor uh, and our social rights as a working class, we also have to keep an eye on the rise of violent fascists in this country, right? In tandem with an increasingly reactionary anti 
democracy, Republican Party on the national scale, makes for a very uh, disconcerting uh, political environment. So how do we do that, right? Well, we do that by creating strong anti-fascist unions. We do that by creating strong rake and file structures in shops where shops are able to take care of, watch out for, and, and be proactive in their communities uh, concerning such threats. But that too needs to be part of the focus. And there's been a rise of incidents, racist incidents, uh, not just in the community, but on the job, hanging nooses. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any national campaign by labor uh, against these racist attacks in an organized way. What, what can change that? Because these uh, large number of workers are being uh, terrorized, not just in the community uh, by the police, but by incidents on the job. And these continue. Well, we have to be more proactive in addressing community concerns, for sure. Like if you look at a number of our unions, like AFSCME, like uh, the UAW, uh, we have a huge amount of folks from the BIPOC communities who are members, right? So they share our concerns too about the safety in their communities. But we need to think about labor, not just as something that deals with contracts, that deals with narrow self-interest uh, in the factory. We have to think about labor as a political, a social and political force that reaches down in the communities and not as only is willing to picket or strike uh, to win a race, which they shouldn't, but also willing to step up and take direct action to defend working class communities, the, the same communities that they live in. On September 18th and 19th, we're slated to have our Vermont AFL-CIO convention. It's an election year, by the way, and our United Slate is, is running um, a full slate uh, for office once again. But we're also going to be considering a resolution that would put the Vermont AFL-CIO on record uh, as militantly anti-fascist, willing to defend our communities, and also in opposition to gun control. And that might be surprising to some of your listeners, but part of our thinking here is we need the, the right wing, the far right, is armed. They're armed to the teeth. There's not a law that you could pass in the world that would take those guns away from them. They represent an imminent and dangerous threat to BIPOC communities, to working class communities, to low income communities, and to democracy herself. So what we are gonna do is we're gonna take a strong stance. We're gonna have our members decide if we take a strong stance against gun control in order to allow us, continue to allow us the means to defend our communities uh, if uh, violent insurrections or, or lone uh, wolf extremist attacks were to occur, be it in the workplaces or, or in our communities. And one of the issues uh, that is uh, part of the crisis in the labor movement is business unionism, corporate unionism. Uh, during the witch hunts in the 40s and 50s, communist leftists were thrown out, purged of the unions. Yep. The AFL-CIO was formed uh, really against leftists and communists. Uh, they were banned. And also the AFL-CIO work with the CIA around the world and still takes over $30 million a year from the National Endowment in, for Democracy for their solidarity center. Uh, this uh, political uh, orientation of the unions, you think that that's a problem in really fighting to defend workers in this country and around the world? Well, look, we need to, we need to rethink um, the role of organized labor, uh, not just in our, the domestic sphere, but also in the international sphere. Now, nationally, uh, labor, as such, be it uh, AFL-CIO or other large unions, they, they have not taken the right position when it comes to things like the occupation uh, of, in Palestine. They have not taken the, a proactive position concerning the YPG and YPJ and their struggle, Kurdish-led struggle in Syria for a more direct democracy. Uh, these are places, they have not taken a, a stance on the, the embargo on Cuba. Uh, so we here in the Vermont AFL-CIO, we've taken a stance on all three. We've called for an end to the embargo. We've called for an end to the occupation of Palestine. And we recognize and stand in firm support of the, the Kurdish-led government in Syria. So we got to get rid of the notion of the AFL-CIO working in tandem with groups like the CIA for reactionary ends across the, the world. We need to instead work in solidarity with working class folks and unions in every country towards a more liberatory, a more free, and a more socialistic uh, economy in all of these places. And, and we are strong together as an international working class. Once we get, once we get narrowly focused on so-called national capitalist type interests, 
uh, then, then we've lost track of our basic mission. I'll also say that uh, we used to have, until last year, that same anti-communist language in the Vermont AFL-CIO constitution. And by an overwhelming vote of our members at the 2020 convention, our members voted to remove that language and to replace it with language barring fascists and racists from holding officer positions or affiliating with the Vermont AFL-CIO. We're proud to do that. We recognize that we need uh, a united front when it comes to combating the right. And we don't do that by dividing ourselves. And are you opposed to the AFL-CIO taking over $30 million a year for the National Endowment for Democracy to fund the uh, Solidarity Center, which is presently the, the situation? I think we should take a, a penny, a penny in per caps per member, and we could fund it ourselves. And if you take out some of those tens of millions of dollars from those elections uh, that we keep sinking our money into and not getting anything for any bank from our buck, we get a plenty of money to go around to hire organizers and to do international solidarity. Now, the other issue, obviously, is, is the climate. Uh, in California, there are, there are wildfires. Uh, there's a drought uh, around the country. You just have this hurricane, uh, which shut down New Orleans, shut down the power supply. Um, the energy companies uh, still pretty, rough, uh, pretty uh, much running roughshod, continuing their production of oil. Um, and uh, the, these companies apparently control the uh, both the Democrats and Republicans, as far as the Congress is concerned. Um, the issue of energy and control of the utilities, you see that any change in the, in the fight against the climate situation with uh, these private companies in charge of energy who make profit by pumping more oil, selling more electricity? I mean, it seems that's their agenda. Well, and many of them don't pay a lick in taxes either. So, what, I mean, look, if I had a magic wand, or if we had a, a, a much stronger mass movement, I would say just nationalize the sons of bitches and then we could deal with how we more responsibly control the energy, energy sector towards uh, the goal of having it operate towards the public good as opposed to the profit of the few. We've seen enough of the profit of the few for the last hundred years. And you know what? It's not working. As you said earlier, we're in the midst of a pandemic. There are still people who are out of work. There are people that are sick. There are people without health care. There are people who are now being evicted. And enough is enough. So, so yes, I mean, we need to, to not only think about labor. We need to not only think about our bread and butter issues. We also have to think about sustainability over the long haul. But I don't believe the large capitalist forces uh, who control the energy sector give a damn about the public good, give a damn about sustainability. So we need to change that. We need a Green New Deal. We need to invest millions, uh, billions or trillions of dollars into renewable energy, but we have to do it in such a way where it's a public utility, where they are publicly owned and operated for the, the, for the good of all, built with union labor and run by union labor. And in California right now, there is a recall. You might even have a uh, Republican uh, elected as governor because of the anger against the Democrat, Governor Newsom, who um, has attacked labor, has he, he, uh, cut back on Cal OSHA. Um, the agencies, uh, Department of Motor Vehicles, uh, haven't been able to get licenses out to people. Uh, the uh, EDD hasn't been able to get unemployment benefits out. People are still waiting for their unemployment benefits after being laid off. It seems that the right wing are using that opportunity uh, of the Democrats to go after them. And that's, as a matter of fact, how Schwarzenegger was elected. It seems like the right wing is having some opportunities nationally because of the role of the Democratic Party politicians. Yeah, and regardless of what happens in California, the situation is going to be much worse on a national scale during the uh, midterm elections for Congress if the Democrats uh, ref don't refuse to pass the PRO Act and if they're unable to pass the human infrastructure um, aspects of the budget bill. Uh, let alone, let alone um, the Voting Rights Act. And to do that, they're going to have to get rid of the filibuster. But, he, but uh, the public is, is, recognizes that the Democrats are full of shit. They recognize that, right? In their moments of clarity, they see that. They see the promises they make on the campaign trail, and yet they, see, they fail to see the, the, the promises come to fruition after Election Day. So every few years, people say, oh, what the hell? You know, I, I voted for the Democrats. They, they didn't deliver. 
So I guess I'll try my lot with the other ones, two sides of the same coin, both capitalist parties. So this is what happens and the pendulum swings, but it doesn't swing far. So we need to build alternatives to the Democrats and the Republicans. Uh, we need to first and foremost, not rely on any political party as our source of power. We need to rely on ourselves and our own unity and our own organizing to build that power. But second to that, we have to look at alternatives uh, when it comes to the electoral system. We've talked before, Steve, about here in Vermont, we have three parties. We have the Democratic Socialist um, Oriented Vermont Progressive Party, which is a real party with a caucus in uh, our state house and which has, uh, is the largest party in our largest city of Burlington. So we just elected, we endorsed the Vermont AFL-CIO in a special election, a progressive party candidate, Joe McGee for Ward 3 up in Burlington. And we won. And we won, we won that one a few weeks back. So there are ways to do this, but there has to be a will. And for there to be a will, we need the national leaders of labor to wake up or we need to throw them out and replace them and see that the Democrats are not serving our interests. And it's time for us to look at alternatives. And we are uh, coming on the 31st of the, which was supposed to be the pullout. The US troops have been pulled out, but the United States says they're gonna continue to bomb over the horizon, they call it. Uh, we have a military budget of 750 billion a year um, we spent 2.3 trillion and probably more in Afghanistan when our infrastructure is falling apart. When people don't have health care, you have homeless all over this country. Uh, the military uh, interventions in the United States with over 800 bases uh, continue. And it, yet the Democrats and Republicans seem to accept that we have to have uh, these 800 bases. We have to spend 750 billion on protecting America. Is America being protected uh, by uh, this massive amount of military spending? A couple of things come to mind on that. Number one is if you could afford at great cost, both economic and, and in humans, if you could afford to bomb children in Iraq, you could afford to feed children in the United States, like right off the bat. You have to look at where, where is our goddamn priorities as a people? But are we safer because we have more bombs than other folks? Uh, I would counter to say that one of the most stringent police states in an industrialized world is Israel, and perhaps they get bombed more than any other industrialized country in the world as well. So I don't know that military strength, certainly not alone, doesn't make you safer as a people. But uh, what, and I'll tell you what else, exploiting the world markets for the benefit of the 1% here in the United States certainly doesn't make us safer. You know, but the war in Afghanistan wasn't winnable from the beginning, Steve. I mean, how many empires have um, crashed and burned when they had dreams of taking Afghanistan from the Greeks uh, to the British, to the Russians, and then, and then the United States? 20 years ago, I wrote about this. I understand the anger that came out of 9-11. I have uh, zero love for the Taliban or Al-Qaeda, uh, but uh, to occupy that country, who frankly has been in a state of occupation intermittently for over a thousand years without giving up or surrendering, uh, that outcome was very predictable from the start. But the pullout had to happen at some point or another. I just hope the pullout is complete and that our politicians, both Republican and Democrats, don't work to try to get us back suck, sucked back in. And this program that you're talking about uh, and some of the issues that you're talking about, how do you see taking that up politically within the labor movement? Um, you see that as a program to fight for in the national AFL-CIO because the AFL-CIO, despite the fact that it did call for withdrawal from Afghanistan, continues to support the military budget. And many national unions would say, well, we can't cut massively the military budget because our members would be affected. Uh, they would lose money. Um, and that's one question. The other question is the United States now, the Democrats and Republicans, Pelosi say we have to have this military to uh, uh, take on China and we have to go after China. Um, and that's why we need the, uh, the increased military budget. We have to have an encirclement of China. Where do you stand on that? We spend more money as one country on our military than the rest of the world combined, in essence. So look, you could cut the military budget in half and we're still spending more than any other country in the entire world uh, on military care. So if you want to talk about a just transition, I mean, this is an appropriate place to talk about one, you know, 
We have factories right now producing guns, producing bombs. They could produce respirators. You know, they could produce uh, they could produce things that are actually of the common uh, uh, for the common good, as opposed to for common death. Uh, they they hardly would even need many of them to be retrofitted. I mean, the the infrastructure is already there. It's just a question of what our priority is as a civilization, as a people, as a society. And we need to step back from the role of the United States as an imperial power and step into a new role as the United States and us as a country, as a people, as a society, which works in cooperation with other nations towards a common uh, sustainable development for all. But we are a long way from that. But of course, the national AFL-CIO has a moral and political responsibility to engage in, engage in that, uh, those issues. Of course we do. Uh, Vermont AFL-CIO, we're proud members of uh, Labor Against Racism and War. Uh, many other, a number of other labor organizations across the United States are. And through that organization, we do engage in issues. We were proud to sign uh, one of the co-signers of the letter that was recently published in the New York Times calling for an end of the embargo on Cuba. So China does not have to be an existential enemy, right? Cuba certainly does not belong on any list of, of enemies. Uh, as far as I could tell, uh, the two things that they stand out for is providing health care to all their citizens and actively uh, fighting with guns, with arms, against the apartheid state of South Africa uh, in their colonial um, uh, intrusions into southern, other parts of Southern Africa. So we need to be internationalists in our outlook. We need to not be pacifists per se, but we need to choose where we engage and how we engage. I would advocate in a different direction when it comes to the Kurds in Syria, the YPG and YPJ. I think one of the greatest mistakes or betrayals that the Trump administration did was uh, pulling the symbolic amount, uh, small symbolic force that was there that allowed Turkey to invade uh, northern uh, part of Rojava. So we need to have nuanced approaches, but the role of the United States as an imperial power must come to an end. Well, you've uh, said that you want to have a challenge, a political challenge, a programmatic challenge uh, to the leadership of the AFL-CIO. And you uh, said you were looking for someone to take that on. Um, if, uh, say, Sarah Nelson of uh, AFA does not run, are you willing to run for president of the, the AFL-CIO to, to at least raise the issues that there needs to be a political challenge to the present agenda of the AFL-CIO? Uh, myself and the United States of the AFL-CIO would welcome Sarah Nelson running for president. And, and I would endorse her and campaign for her and work hard to get her elected. But beyond that, Steve, I'm very much focused on my reelection bid right now that happens in a few weeks here in Vermont and doing the best job I can as Vermont AFL-CIO president. I don't know what the future has in store, but right now that's where my focus is. Are you optimistic that uh, working people in this country can get it together to deal with these challenges? Goddamn right. We're going to win. History is on our side. And I have zero doubt that when, when everything's counted at the end, uh, we're going to come out on top. We are the 99% of the world, working class people. The unions are the vanguard of that 99%. And with those numbers, it's only a question of when, not if we succeed and we win. Okay, well, I want to thank you for joining us. We've been talking with Dave Van Dusen. He's the president of the Vermont AFL-CIO. Thanks for joining us, David. Thanks, Steve.